Hi, EA Global, and uh, welcome to this session with Ezra Klein. Uh, he and I recorded this interview for the 80,000 Hours podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but we have decided to premiere the second half here uh, at EA Global Reconnect uh, so that you can hear Ezra's thoughts uh, about effective altruism, uh, long-termism, uh, and also how to improve journalism. If you want to go out and hear the full version of the conversation, you'll be able to find it on the 80,000 Hours podcast feed uh, when we release it, uh, which, if Kieran and I are organized enough, uh, should be happening uh, right about now. In the first half, we have a pretty feisty conversation about politics, uh, including what Ezra thinks are the most important policy priorities in the US today, uh, whether prices for goods should massively go up uh, during disasters, uh, and whether we talk enough about the possibility that AI will soon leave people uh, with relatively few jobs to do. Of course, uh, you can find that by searching for 80,000 hours uh, wherever you get podcasts and hitting that beautiful subscribe button. All right, uh, for those of you who don't already know, uh, Ezra Klein is an American journalist who first rose to prominence in the mid 2000s uh, for his individual blogging, uh, before then being picked up to blog for The American Prospect uh, and then The Washington Post. In 2014, uh, he left WAPO though uh, to co-found the news website Vox.com, uh, where he worked as executive director and also hosted the fabulously popular podcast, uh, The Ezra Klein Show. Uh, while at Vox, uh, Ezra helped start the Future Perfect Vertical, uh, which does journalism with an effective actress flavor, uh, and in my view, is some of the most valuable reporting uh, being written out there. In 2020, he published the book, Why We're Polarized, and then just a couple of months ago, uh, he left Vox to start a new column uh, and host a revamped Ezra Klein show uh, at the New York Times. 40% of the incoming Biden administration uh, follow Ezra on Twitter, uh, which I think is really impressive. But I think really the most important thing is that he is a regular listener to the 80,000 Hours podcast himself. All right, without further ado, here is the second half of my conversation with Ezra. Enjoy. In your email to me a few weeks ago, you said, I've been thinking a lot about how effective altruism can and should uh, influence media coverage. Um, yeah, what, what did you end up concluding about that? Um, how, how do you think you can get kind of more coverage of the most important issues in, in the New York Times more broadly, just beyond choosing, choosing topics for your, for your own column? Well, I don't know about the New York Times more broadly because I I have made the decision to step out of management for a while and I'm exulting in that in that uh, capacity to just worry about my own things. But 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 let me talk about what I was thinking about there and what I'm still thinking about because um, I, I do think about I do think about this part broadly. Um, the question here is how does journalism, capital J, journalism as an industry, how does it decide what's important? Like, how do we decide, given everything that could be on the front page, right? Given that every day could be, and this many people died of malaria today, too. Mm. Like, how do we decide what is there? And the answer is complicated. Like, the answer is some mixture. Like, and, and it's, by the way, non-rigorous and not a framework that we would ever publish publicly and not something where I think we even hew very well to our own public rhetoric about it. It is some mixture of a subjective judgment of importance, a subjective judgment of like how interesting something is, how interesting it will be to the audience. And by the way, I think that's become stronger in the age of social media mm -hmm. where there's more of a sense of like everybody is talking about X. And so, of course, you have to put something about X, you know, on your on your homepage. Um, but X is obvious is often something dumb. And yeah. so maybe it wasn't that important. Um, and then and this one's really important to me. Path dependence. Yeah. Things that we have believed to be important in the past. Um, we tend to give an easier ride to being important in the future. Like something I think that I've been signaling in this conversation is I think taxes in general are less important than the DC political debate makes them seem. Mm. Um, and, but that comes from like for a very long time, they have been important. We have forever have taxing um, debates in Washington. There are like a lot of committees that do it. Like there have been periods when like the d debates we're having over the tax code were really central to how the economy would perform. We've done really big reforms that were needed at other times in our history. And so issues we know about and have an entire superstructure for considering congressional committees, think tanks, experts, et cetera, um, get a lot more play than issues that don't have that structure. So take AI here. Like I certainly think AI is more important than marginal changes in taxation over the next 10 or 15 years, but there's very little infrastructure for considering it. There isn't a committee in Congress that primarily deals with AI. It's like a sub issue of some of the like the backwater technology committees. Um, there aren't like, you know, in the executive branch, it's not really anybody's like distinctive job. There aren't like big think tanks on this. I know there are a couple out here in, 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 in the Bay Area that look at it and, and at Oxford, but it's not something like where Brookings has a gigantic AI program. Um, there aren't as many interests coming in on it. And so that issue where things that have been important in the past have a superstructure for pushing importance in the future, relationships with journalists, like think tank reports that are coming out, lobbyists who are like talking to members of Congress on it, 
all of that, it, it really matters. And so like, that's why I think a lot about frameworks. And, and one reason that, uh, you know, I wanted to create Future Perfect um, at, at Vox is as I began to learn about effective altruism, one of my I immediate views on it was this is a framework for thinking about importance that could be a different lens we could use in journalism. Like it could help us order things differently. Like politics has its ordering, like its ordinal ranking of priorities and effective altruism has its ordinal ranking of priorities, more or less. I'm not saying in any place it's like all written down and agreed upon, but, but I think you can, you can get it, you get, you get it in the water. And it's not even that I think I fully agree all the time with EA's or ordinal ranking of priorities. It's that I think it is another really valuable lens and should be one that like, you know, we actually explicitly put into newsrooms to cover um, yeah. In the same way that people who are, you know, a political journalist, like have the political lens. So that's why that's part of the way it influences my work. Like I talk to EA people, I ask them what they think is important. And it's like in the back of my mind, like, am I actually covering these things or not? And if I'm not, then do I have a good excuse for why I'm not? Am I sure that the work I'm doing is more valuable than, than that would be? Yeah, I kind of always want to look for what's the systematic reason that the incentives line up such that some things get covered. And I guess you were saying one one reason is just path dependence that like kind of whatever's been covered in the past kind of tends to carry on. I guess like are things that were in the curriculum a hundred years ago are sometimes still in the curriculum today, even if, if you wouldn't add them if you're going from if you're going from, from scratch. But the, the problem seems pretty fundamental because it's mo most people read the news like not necessarily for information that they're going to take action on. Um, that it's more kind of for entertainment. I guess recently it's been, been because people are terrified and they want to understand things. But more often people are kind of reading it out of like general interest. They just kind of want it to be interesting or, or to be entertaining. And if that, if that's the pull from consumers, if that's what they're kind of demanding, then um, for businesses that are trying to provide that, it, the, the journalism doesn't have to be about the most impressing issues and, and how to solve them or, or even just like the most pressing issues in general. It can kind of be about whatever, whatever people can, can spin as kind of entertaining. Um, do, do you agree that that's kind of I like mean, that is a true. fundamental issue? Yeah. Yeah, but, but I would think about that a little differently. I think it is important to admit that journalism, that there is a part of why people read the news that is entertainment and hobbyism. You're not going to get rid of that. But it's only one thread. People want a mix of stuff that is interesting. They want a mix of stuff. I mean, and we've always had this, right? We have sections in the news. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that you have a style section and a culture section and like the, you know, the magazine that comes out on Sunday where you have like long form interesting work um, and you also have the A section and A1 and, you know, what you want to be doing is having the right mix across the entire product. Because also, by the way, for what you're talking about, like let's say you you, you blow the whole thing up and you say, yeah. I'm going to rigorously only cover the most important stories in the world. Yeah. And then nobody reads your publication. Is that actually a good, you know, you actually need to cross subsidize things. Yeah. It has forever been the case that political coverage has more power in local newspapers because sports coverage is also in the paper. People who wouldn't come to an all mm. local political corruption news outlet <laughs> do come to learn about the local sports team. And then when they see a political corruption story, that corruption has power because like the, 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 the people in power know that everybody coming to the paper to check out how the sports team did saw it. So you are dealing with an ecosystem, uh, a bundle that, that, that needs to be taken seriously. My issue is more like within the part of that bundle that is like that imagines itself Self as like we do the important work. Do we actually have the right priority structure? And I would say in general that we don't. Um, we sometimes do. And I think probably the past year with coronavirus and things, we, we've been better. But I think there's a, a lot of path dependence, a lot of pretending that controversy is a driver of importance. Um, and also just like sometimes a, a lack of creativity in, in how to do coverage uh, that is that is a problem. Uh, but I, 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 it has always been my belief. It was, I think, proven out at Vox. I see it currently at the Times in my columns. If you do important stuff well, there's an audience for it always. And and I do think it's harder sometimes to do well, right? You can't just like drift off of the fact that everybody's talking about something and so they might click on it pretty easily. But I, I've i always said this, this is like one of my like refrains at, at Vox as an editor. If there is something important happening in the world and you can't make the audience interested in it, that is always your failure and it is never the audience's failure. Like it is our job as professional writers and video makers and podcasters and whatever to make this stuff appealing and things people like engaging with as opposed to things that are complicated, boring, and that turn them off. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a productive attitude to, to have as a, as a content producer. But there are like, there's a lot of issues where it's just like, shoveling shit uphill to some degree or it's like it's, it's a lot harder there's, there's some things that are much easier much more grabby to the human mind um than than others and 
uh, to, like, yeah, I guess you just just have to recognize that it's going to be yeah potentially challenging to fund the coverage of really boring or like do really unpleasant things. Like, people don't want to read about factory farming, I think, because it's extremely unpleasant and it's challenging for them, and that that makes it kind of hard. To, Although, but hard I, to I'll tell you, animal basis. coverage does yeah. animal coverage does great. Like really? animal suffering issue, they do great. Like that's actually like a, that is a an incorrect. I'm not saying you're incorrect. It, I think it is a broadly believed thing that nobody's going to oh. read this stuff. And I can say with real certainty they do. And by the way, pretty within the EA world, it is very much a case that some of the things that, that effective altruists care a lot about yeah. are like catnip for readers. So, for instance, um, I think in many ways. AI existential AI risk gets too much coverage compared to like what might AI do over the next 20 years. Yeah. Um, not to say it gets too much funding. I know, I know, <laughs> but it gets a lot of coverage. coverage but job. one reason, one reason Lots it gets a lot of coverage fetish. is that yeah. it's super interesting. Like it's like reading science. Yeah. It's like reading the, the term, like the news stories that, you know, come before the Terminator saga. And so why doesn't then, why is it there then more just like broad coverage of AI? I think that actually has a lot more to do with path dependence than it does with reader interest. I think a lot of things we cover in journalism are less intrinsically interesting than like, are we creating super intelligent computers and will those computers kill us? You know, but we don't like, there are a lot of people who've been working at outlets for a long time who cover, um, you know, Congress and not a lot of people who cover AI. And so like, that's actually something that in 30 years may just be different, but there is a, there is a, a, a lag in the institutional structure. Like it's hard to get journals to cover stuff. They don't, they don't know. And, and it's hard to, this is just like a, a an institutional management thing, but it's often hard to move to like be the first to move people onto new beats. And then also if your business model is under stress, which is true for almost everybody in journalism, um, it's really hard to then like take flyers on new beats. Yeah. Yeah. So I really, the framing you're taking this is like different and maybe better than the one that I've usually had in my head. Cause I, I've usually thought about this as like, how do you get more funding or like more like advertising revenue so that you can like fund more people to more people like uh, Dylan Matthews and Kelsey working at, at Future Perfect covering those issues. But you're thinking more like there's already people who think of themselves as covering the most important issues in a sophisticated way. And sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're covering things that actually aren't that important. And maybe we could switch them and like get them to think about that other issues are more important. I would think of that as a process, actually, that, you know, one of the points of Fox, one of the points of Future Perfect is to change journalism more broadly, not just within the walls of the institution, but but to, to create models of things that other people are going to use. I would say that if you look at explanatory journalism, it looks different from before we launched at Vox. It's everywhere. And people have learned a lot of those lessons um, in, in the way we tried to do them. And then, you know, I think this is less true for Future Perfect yet. But to your point, we built Future Perfect on an alternative funding stream. Like I worked with the Rockefeller Institute. Um, I'm sorry. I worked with the Rockefeller Foundation to get the seed funding for that organization. And then um, it's ha it has a more diverse set of, of, of philanthropic funders now. But if it keeps growing, which I hope it will, and by the way, I think that's a totally reasonable way to fund journalism. Um, if it keeps growing over time, it will also just, you know, other places will compete, maybe not just your philanthropic, but just by, you know, making that something that their advertising dollars cover. And of course, by the way, at Vox, advertising dollars also cover Future Perfect, right? Everything is cross-subsidized. But, um, but yeah, I don't think what you're saying is wrong. What I would say is I would think about that as a process. I would think about you want to create... It is very helpful when trying to get a new form of coverage off the ground to create a funding model for it. But once that funding model is created, um, if it is successful at some point, it is going to um, just become part of the core operations of the institution. So a good example here, I would say, is, is poverty and inequality coverage. Um, there is, if you look around the media, a lot of coverage of poverty and inequality issues funded by foundations. Um, Ford did a big project a couple of years back. Uh, at the same time, there is a lot of poverty and inequality coverage that is not funded by foundation. This is just like, you're an economy reporter, report on some poverty stuff. Uh, and so what you want is that, that mix, but that comes once you've like won the, the war over whether or not this is a core issue that is part of like simply a responsible news package. I'm super interested to know if there's any other lessons you learned. I guess you found out that animal welfare, factory farming stuff does quite well. What other like really important issues do like surprisingly well with, with the audience and actually have legs? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I have a list like that. I think animals is actually at the top of my list of something people like are quite wrong about. Yeah. With other things, it tends to depend really on how you do it. Uh, uh, and yeah. so, uh-huh. Oh, no, go on. No, I was just going to say that there are, 
there are a lot of issues where there's a huge amount of variance in how well yeah. things do. And it just kind of depends. Did you frame it well? Like, did the, did like the spirits of the internet pick it up or not? And so there aren't that many where it's just like a cheat code to, to writing about it. I mean, there are, there are people who do well. Like, it's very easy to get traffic for like writing about Elon Musk, for instance. You know, there, yeah. there are certain things that if you can attach them to somebody, like that will make it easier to get, to get attention. Um, but but there aren't that many things where I think there's a like a broad issue that like if only we covered it everybody would would love reading the the article. I don't think there's that many twenty dollar bills like down on the journalism floor. Yeah. But there's you know doing things better things and worse. Fine, yeah. Are there any things that where it's the other way around where you might expect it to be popular but actually it just uh, regularly tank? I think Kelsey in my interview with her a few years ago said that she was always disappointed with the traffic numbers. I think on the global development stuff because she'd like write very good sophisticated articles about like what works in global <laughs> development and she just found it very hard to get lots of lots of readers for those. Yeah, I think global development is probably the best answer to that. Um, I, again, I want to be really clear. It's not impossible. We yeah. have had great readership for global development things. There's a lot of ways to try to approach it. But it is hard to get people interested. It is hard to get an American audience interested in problems afflicting people somewhere else. Yeah. Like, that is just, like, that is just true. Um, and, you know, I think it relates to kind of pretty normal things in human nature. But but, but that's a that's a that's a fact. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to think about what question to do next. So, so yeah, in terms of the, the broader uh, group of people in the media who think of themselves as covering, you know, really important issues, they want to like deal with what is the most, what are the most important issues, and what what do people really need to know in order to make the world better? What what can be done to get them to, uh, I guess, cover issues that, well, in as much as they're mistaken, I guess, <laughs> in as much as we have some some wisdom to share about what actually is more important than what they're already covering, uh, what, what what do you think can be done to kind of change the past dependency there to get us out of like the the path that we're currently on? So I'm gonna I'm gonna press on the point you made a second ago. I think it'd be really good if something that effective altruists tried to do was create business models for the kind of coverage they would like to see. Yeah. Like I don't think um, I think media is often a public good. I think it really can focus attention. I think it can very much focus political attention and 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 change like the outcomes of legislation. And so you know at a time of a lot of media stress, I think it's for a lot of funders would be a really high return, low dollar investment. I mean maybe I'm talking my book here, but now I'm I'm a New York Times columnist. You're not going to be funding me. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to try to create these models. I don't think what's going to happen is you're going to call people up and be like, you're doing your coverage all wrong. And they're going to say, oh, thank you, you know, for telling me like my life's work <laughs> is garbage. I think, I think, I don't think path dependence tends to end because you like tell people like snap out of it. Mm. Um, I think that what happens is like new institutions arise that I, that force everybody else to, to competitively react. Um, so, did, did, you know, I do, I think on... Future Perfect is having some of this effect and, and I think there's a lot more opportunity, um, including in Future Perfect itself. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on what those models might be? I mean, I guess there's, philanthropy seems like pretty promising. Um, I think uh, Open Phil has funded Future, oh, actually, no, sorry, not Open Phil. <laughs> the other group funded a Future Perfect, but they, they recently funded a series of articles on factory farming, I think, in The, in the Guardian. And it's kind of amazing uh -huh. to me how cheap it is to pay writers to, to do journalism or how, how many stories you can get and how many views you can get for a relatively small amount of, yep. of, uh, of donor funding. Um, are there any other business models that people should, should think about here other than, other than um, foundation funding? And I guess just trying to That's do a good question. Um, I mean, I think foundation funding is good. I think trying to, I like the model of trying to build institutions inside institutions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one way foundations often think about this is, you know, we're going to go to the Atlantic and we're going to, you know, partner. Um, and there's going to be 15 articles over the next year on, you know, the racial wealth gap. I mean, this is a hypothetical I want to note. Um, great. Um, and that's a good thing to do. And then, you know, that, that orients the coverage in that way, it creates resources to do more reporting, right? Doing this coverage well is very, it can be, can be not expensive by the terms of like foundation funding, but mm. expensive by the terms of, of journals and budgets. Uh, but I think there's real value in going bigger than that, uh, and creating like institutions and, you know, sections, right. That have an editor that have writers who are dedicated to this. So it's not like the fifth thing they're doing is they have to fulfill the terms of this, you know, out of, uh, of this, um, foundation partnership, but it's actually like a group of people who are committed to this issue and then can prove out that it works unusually well. And then maybe the larger institution says, that's great. That's working really well. Like let's keep building on that. So I, I would say the thing I think people underestimate here in terms of its value is actually institutions inside institutions creating a new institution is possible but that's a lot of work from scratch 
And you've got to like build your audience from nothing. You have to build a social media team. You have to build potentially an advertising team, like da, 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 da. Like who's doing your CMS? Like how are you doing technical support? There's a lot more that goes into making these things work than people realize. Um, who's doing your, your, you know, your, your legal side. Um, so yeah. bigger organizations already have that and already want to do more than they're able to do currently. And, you know, I think it would not take a ton of investment to be able to create more experimentation in this space. Now, I will say the one thing that that funders always have to be, you know, knowledgeable about and thoughtful about is, you know, journalism really does have walls between like how we fund things and, and, and what the things are. And so mm. you can't always expect the coverage is going to say exactly what you want. Like maybe you fund something that's on AI and the writer comes to the view that AI risk is overstated. You know, like that stuff can and should happen. You're, you're trying to fund journalism here. It's not advertisements. Yeah. But in general, I think pointing more coverage at the right things is great. And so take global development. It does somewhat worse in traffic. It doesn't do unbelievably badly in traffic. And it can be really, really important if the right people read it. So creating a group inside an institution that focus entirely on global development coverage um, and just don't need to worry about traffic is good for everybody. Like it's good coverage for the, from the institution's point of view. It's good for the world. Um, we just It shouldn't be the case that everything needs to support itself on, on advertising and scale. Yeah. I guess you had a particular vision for Vox in the early days. Uh, are there any parts of that vision that kind of haven't yet eventuated, but uh, but is something that a listener could potentially work on and, and, and might, might succeed at creating? I don't know if you'll succeed at creating it. There's a very core part of that vision that didn't, that didn't work. Um, so when we launched Vox, uh, the way we thought about it, and this was very, very dear to my heart, was we thought about explanatory not as an approach to all products, but as actually a core product. The idea was that you would have these continuously updated topic guides, these resources that so, you know, as like Sarah Cliff is covering the Affordable Care Act um, and everything that changes with it, she's basically continuously updating what's like, I don't want to call it a Wikipedia article because it'd be written by Sarah, by Sarah fucking Cliff, <laughs> but um but like the single best guide to the underlying topic anywhere. And I, I, I think a really big problem in journalism is that uh, the audience is often coming into stories midstream. Yeah. So you're coming in and, you know, there's all this jargon you don't understand. There are players whose role you don't know. You know, what you need is really good topic information, but it's hard to find. I mean, Wikipedia is OK. And it's like, I mean, as an institution, extraordinary. Yeah. But for any individual thing can often be disappointing. And so I had really, like, we had this whole product called card stacks and they're different. Re Some of them really worked. I mean, we had an ISIS card stack that got tens of millions of, of views. It was just a great product by Zach Beecham. Yeah. There are a lot of issues with it. One, it's unbelievably resource intensive, but two, the big thing that happened is that we launched Vox before the great platform fracturing. Mm. So before like Facebook instant articles and Flipboard and Google AMP and like everybody was reading every Apple News. Everybody's reading stuff not on your core platform anymore. Yeah. So in many cases, the number of people reading like on your website is, you know, a half of the number of people reading it. And so things that are bespoke product innovations yeah. that then do not translate everywhere else become a really hard way to, to justify investment. So so of the things, there are a lot of things that worked at Fox. There are a lot of things that, that I didn't imagine that we did that like worked beautifully. But that was the thing that was really important to me and still to me feels like an unsolved problem in journalism. Like, let's say you don't want to know what's up in coronavirus today. Mm -hmm. You want to know about coronavirus. And not like something somebody wrote about it 20 months ago, but like updated to today. Like, how should I understand this whole thing? Like, where do I start? Um, for, I think that's that often is, something we failed at. For, yeah, for me, that is Wikipedia. I've, I've found that yeah, very often if there's like a current event or something going on, a, a person, whatever, it's much better just to like look it up on Wikipedia. Yep. And then just like, I mean, during the during the coronavirus pandemic, I literally was like just like constantly reading the coronavirus uh, or COVID-19 like Wikipedia entry. And that was much better yeah. than trying to track things through the newspaper. So I wonder if there's an opportunity to try to like build that out within Wikipedia. And that could be a way to get explainers. And I guess yeah. to some extent, Wikipedia could. I mean, like that might a, be. Maybe you want to fund people to be to, to, to be helping with Wikipedia, but I think there should be competition to Wikipedia. Not because yeah. I want to take down Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. <laughs> it's an extraordinary thing. It's like one of the great marvels of the internet age. I'm just yeah. saying that it shouldn't be your only option. Um, and, and by the way, some people have done this well. Like one I, I want to call out here, I think also on coronavirus, our world and data's um, basically oh, like primers are extraordinary. They don't do that on every issue, but, but yeah. like you see how effective that's been on that particular issue. So, you know, this is a big project. You need a lot of money to do it well, given the range of things you might want to do, because you don't just want to do, it's very easy to talk about like the 10 biggest issues, 
But there's a lot of things to our whole conversation here we're covering that are not the 10 biggest issues. Mm -hmm. And so then you really get into to resource constraints. But but yeah, that's something that I still care about. I still don't quite understand the model for like, you know, uh, and I still feel is unsolved. Um, uh, again, with the exception of the, the great work Wikipedia does. Yeah, is there anything else you want to say on our world and data? I, I'm, I'm hoping to get Max Rosa or someone else from there on the, on the show at some point because their traffic is unbelievable. I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head and maybe, maybe they're not public, but they're getting a lot of traffic uh, on, on a really quite small budget. And obviously they're providing like fantastic information to people, like potentially really helping them to, to understand the world. So I see that as a huge success in journalism of a, of a kind. Yeah, I think they're fantastic. Um, I don't have a ton more to say except that I really appreciate what they've done and they should come on 80,000 hours. <laughs> Um, how many hours of news do you think a typical person should consume uh, each week? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. It depends who you are and what you're doing. And also depends if you enjoy consuming news or not. Yeah. I think the bigger question actually is like, give it for a, a given number of hours of news, how are you consuming it? Hmm. Uh, a lot of people, I think, think they are consuming news and what they're consuming is political entertainment. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's different. That's um, what I'm doing a lot of the time. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. You know, there's some noise in the signal of Twitter, but if you're just like, if you're like, if the way you get your political news is Twitter, I would say you're, you're, you're not really getting news at a, it, at a depth that maybe you think you are right. It's a feeling of knowing everything, but what you know, is a conversation, not the depth behind the conversation. Um, and I can tell you, cause I know a lot about Twitter analytics. Most people don't <laughs> click through the links. Like there are a lot of links on Twitter. There's not a lot of readership through links on Twitter. Um, so that's one thing. I think it's really important for people to try to consume some local news. You know, you should not, your diet of information should not be all national and international. If it's, if it's so heavily weighted there that you basically don't know the name of, let's say you're in America, your state senator and your, your state, you know, your, your representative, um, you, you need to make sure you're reading something local. So you're developing that set of ideas, political identity. People have a lot more of power and effect on their local politics. So I think that's really important. I don't think people need to consume more news than they want to consume, but I think a lot of people are consuming news in a like a like an inefficient, polarizing, and kind of like addicting way that makes us all feel bad. And look, I'm part of this system too. I talk about this a lot in my book, uh, but but I'll say just for Twitter, I have gone back and forth for years on what my relationship should, to Twitter should be. So I have a very big Twitter audience. Um, I've I think like 2.7 million people there probably they're all bots, <laughs> but, but it's a very, uh, like I can go to Twitter and I can write a thread in five minutes and it'll get, you know, thousands of retweets and I can look on the law analytics. It's like a hundred thousand people saw this and, and it feels kind of great. And also I don't think it's a good ecosystem. I think that most people yeah. on there a lot feel agitated and upset. I think it, it pulls bad behavior out of people. So for a long time, I basically stopped tweeting except for out articles, but I also felt that I wasn't like in this conversation. I, I, my, my basic view on things right now is that the news and like the conversation, capital C, has migrated to not great platforms. Um, and there's not really great answers for individuals about what to do about it. But if you're an individual consuming the news, I don't think you necessarily need to be there. Um, and, you, and, you know, you'll, you'll get more out of reading, you know, I actually really like reading some of the news apps. So I have like, if you look at my phone, I have um, Vox's homepage, like saved as a tile. I have the New York Times like app and I have the New Yorker app. And I really like the three of those. Um, and, you know, I find actually apps to be a really nice reading experience, although Vox doesn't have an app, but has a nice responsive website. And so that's how I do a lot of my consumption. And then, of course, I have the LA Times app, which is where I get a lot of my California news. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point you made about how people should potentially uh, like look at state and state and local news more. I suppose I think that the main people often won't follow it because they think, well, it's not uh, as important as the issues that are that are happening nationally. But I guess because everyone has piled in so hard to the national stuff, in fact, there's these like local things are so neglected that like one person who takes a great interest in them, the one person who like knows a ton about this this local issue at the council, can potentially have much more influence over that than they could over anything nationally. And so even if the stakes are a hell of a lot smaller, maybe like the expected value is is, is higher just because you're you're doing something that is ne that is being inappropriately neglected by others. Yeah, there's a book by a political scientist named Etan Hirsch, and I don't remember, I don't think the book is actually called, I think it's called Politics is for Power, but mm -hmm. the, the core idea of the book is political hobbyism, and, and his idea is that there's a huge difference that most people don't intuitively feel between engaging in politics as a practice of power, right, trying to attain or understand power to change outcomes, mm -hmm. and like just cheering on your team. 
And a lot of people who think they're politically involved, they're not. They're, they're what he calls hobbyists. They're there for the entertainment. I, I have some issues with sort of where Hirsch has gone from here. I think he's gone in a way that's a little bit too dismissive of like some of the way people do their decision making and, 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 and structure this. But, but it's a good provocation for people. And one of the things about local politics is I think local politics often connects you to like power, like this question of why are things happening? What can I do about it? Whereas like getting mad about Donald Trump and Russia, I mean, there's good reason to be mad about Donald Trump and Russia. I'm not one of the people who think that was a, a story that shouldn't have been heavily covered, but it also wasn't something that you were going to do anything about, you know, like if you weren't on Robert Mueller's team and you already knew you were voting <laughs> against Donald Trump, like you had no real uh, effect in that story. I understand why you want to be informed about the world, but if all of your stuff is like that, I think it's worth asking. You know, and you get a very different view of politics being engaged in your local area. So obviously I'm a, I covered national politics in America, and that connects me to the sort of like big Republican Democrat cleavages. Yeah. And I think the Republican Party in recent years, particularly, but not only in the Trump era, has like gone off the rails in a really irresponsible, scary way. And so when I cover national politics, like the sins of the Republican Party are very foremost in my mind. Mm -hmm. But one reason I think it's very actually healthy to, to watch local politics, like I live in California, it's a very blue state. I live in San Francisco, it's a blue part of a very blue state. And there are real failures of, of not just governance here, but more more than there are failures of governance, because I actually think a lot of the leading California politicians uh, ha have a good angle on things. There's a lot of failures of kind of actual progressive on the ground action and decision making. I just read a piece mm. for the Times about, you know, this problem of, of, of what I call sort of symbolic liberalism and operational conservatism in, in California, where, yeah. you know, people have like a Black Lives Matter, no human being is a legal sign in their yards. And then they're part of a community that was single family zoning that is organizing against any kind of affordable housing development. And the average house costs $922,000. Yeah. That's not progressive in my view. Like that's actually a really bad way of doing it. But one thing that it, it's it's nice it's sort of restraining thing for me to keep an eye on what's happening around me, both because I can be uh, hopefully influential in it in, in, in certain ways, but also because there are different problems in different places, different problems in different um, constellations of power. My views about like the problems of like the national political collision are different actually than my views about the problems in California. And it's nice. It's like a, I think it's a good habit of mine to make sure you're not overly bought into just one cleavage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I spend a lot of time consuming news, but I, I do think probably on reflection, it's a fairly poor use of my time because just so often I'm reading things like, I mean, I'm not on the fence about, well, I can't vote in US elections, but even if I could, I'm not on the fence about whether to vote for Trump or not. So it's not really, most of this stuff isn't news that I can use. Um, and I'm kind of honest about the fact that I'm reading a lot of this stuff either as kind of like disaster porn or uh, because uh, I just like find it really interesting as a kind of entertainment blood sport sort of thing. Um, yeah. I find it very hard to break that addiction. I, I know some people who basically don't consume news almost at all. Uh, and I think good for them by and large, because it uh, helps them to preserve their attention to do other really useful things. Um, yes, maybe, maybe they lose out here and there, but uh, in general, I suspect that it allows them to, to accomplish more good rather than less. I think that's right. I, I, I talk in my book about this story that was in the New York Times a couple of years ago. It's called that, I think it's called The Man Who Knew Too Little. It's about this guy, and there's like a big internet hate over this, but it's about this guy. He was a former Nike executive, and when Donald Trump got elected, he moved to some rural area, mm. and he basically, like, not just stopped consuming news. I don't mean he just stopped reading the news. He wouldn't yeah. let anybody tell him about anything. Oh, he would wow. drop friends if they tried to talk to him about the news. He would only go to the coffee shop really early, and they knew not to let him see the paper. Like, he actually tried to create a bubble for himself where he 100% wouldn't know what is going on. And there was like a big internet hate on this guy. And I, I, I get it, obviously. But like, yeah, real nice for you, former Nike executive, well-off white guy who's decided you don't need to know anything happening. But at the end of this piece, which is by Sam Dolnick, uh, it talks about how what he was spending all of his time on doing and his money on doing was trying to restore, I think it was a wetland right near his mm -hmm. house. Right. So he's like trying to like take this, you know, area. I think there had been mining there or something. And, and make it into a kind of nature preserve that people could come and enjoy. And like one of my provocations in the book is, are you really doing so much better of a job yeah. making things better for people than that guy, right? Like, yeah. are you like getting mad and sending mean tweets to at real Donald Trump or right? back when you could do that, I guess. Like, are you having a better effect than him? And my point is not that you should create a new, uh, like a, a no news bubble for yourself, but, but that we should be tough on ourselves about like, 
what kind of political engagement do we have? Or are we really trying to change things? And if we're not, like, is that what we intended? Like, it's fine if you want to say, I don't like sports, I like politics. Like, I'm not going to tell you that's a, you're allowed to do that. That's no problem. Um, mm -hmm. But if what you're saying to yourself is, I care about making things I'm better for something. the global poor, or I care about climate change, are you are you actually, do you care about those things? Or is that the, like the rationalization for why you like poli for why you like your political sports teams? Yeah. Let's move on and talk about effective altruism and uh, long-termism. What is your biggest critique of the EA community or 80,000 hours advice? If you, if you have any. Um, I'll, I'm going to ask this real quick because I assume you can edit out, but maybe sure. it's hard on video. Can I get a little bit more water real quick? Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Great. I'm just going to tap two, two jars now. Okay, my biggest critique of the of the EA community. I think there are probably a couple um, that, that I would offer. And I say this again, I think people can tell that I like this world and, and yeah. engage with it. And, and so I say this, you know, with, with love, not with um, uh, bitterness. And you ask <laughs> yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. um, so a couple things. One, I think that in sort of direct uh, EA, there is a little bit too much focus on what is measurable. Hmm. And there are a lot of things that are simply hard to measure, and that doesn't mean they're not important. Um, and then simultaneously, because there's a real focus on what is measurable, I often see people trying to measure the unmeasurable hmm. in a way that is, a, like to me, a very false like sense of precision. So I really like Toby Ord, for instance. I had him on my show when he brought out his book. Um, I appreciate that he's got that table in there of his best guesses on how likely things that he has no actual data on how likely they are, are to happen. I think there's something disciplining to that, but I think it's really important to notice too, that there can also be something um, deceptive in your own thinking to that. Like it's all well and good to say, I'm only putting one in 30 down here because I want to tell you like in a clear way what my chances are. Mm. But I can tell you like the way a lot of people read that is like when a like an important philosopher like gives you a table with numbers, it looks a lot more convincing than when he says like, I think there's a low but real chance of this happening. And so I think that both being unwilling to, to to deal with the unmeasurable, but then also trying to create false precision around the unmeasurable can, can can be bad habits. And then the other thing, it's probably a little bit related, but it's not the same. And this is sort of EA rationality. I think there is a, I think it is very easy to tip into embracing an aesthetic of rationality hmm. um, that is not itself actually rational and that yeah. closes you off from other forms of knowing. Like among other things, I think there's an incredible, incredible, incredible uh, resistance to information that comes in a high feelings way. And I am saying this purposefully like a robot to you, totally, yeah. but, but people really want you to perform like a cold, like as if you're a human computer. And if somebody comes and they're like yelling and they're upset and they're crying, you know, or whatever, like the online equivalents are, there can be a real like, Oh, ho, 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 ho. Like you're not having a rational argument with me, yeah. not being able to hear people who are upset and not being able to hear people who haven't like been trained in the particular style of argumentation that you favor is a way of missing super important information about the world. Yeah. And like, I say this as somebody who is very good at rational argumentation, quite enjoys having it, like is well-trained in it. I'm a professional arguer, um, have had like, you know, my share of debates. You can really miss things if you can't hear um, information and if you can't hear signal that doesn't come to you wrapped in the stylistic and cultural like like packaging that you're you're used to and one of my big concerns with the rationality community is that they mistake like like a, a kind a of right? again like an aesthetic a patina of rationality for actually being rational and a lot of actually being rational is understanding how little you know the and and how like limited your own perspective is um i always love tyler cowan once on my podcast said like the rationalists should call themselves the irrationalists <laughs> um i do by the way i like these folks i read yeah. scott um scott alexander uh yeah. you know like I, I've, I've known julie gale for a long time like i like this world and think there's a lot of value in the way they argue but i also think sometimes they're too closed off to counter argument that comes in these ways uh and then i think i had one more um 
yeah, I forgot it. So those are my those are my critiques. It's, uh, yeah, effective altruism like love self critique. Uh, like always, the most popular things on the on the effective altruism forum are people like criticizing. I don't know our advice, the ways we do things wrong. It's like, yeah, it's it's actually an interesting kind of fetish that I think has developed. And I, I, uh, yeah, there's a, there's almost a way it can be dangerous because of course it feels so satisfying to talk about how bad you are to flagellate yourself. Um, I, w I wonder whether sometimes it can be like. Uh, it makes you feel redeemed somehow for your mistakes, or I can't be being up myself if I'm criticizing myself. But I, yes, I, anyway, pe people love my, it. So my you, read of, my more, read of please, those please threads, my, yeah. my read of those threads, and I've seen some of them, is again, a little bit to what I was saying. It, it, there's a beloved nature of critique that is recursive to itself, like yeah. critique that is like, I am the more rational. I'll, <laughs> I'll say one last one. Um, yeah. I think there's a very heavy uh, emphasis on cognitive bias in this community. Yeah. And the best people in it do all that reading and understand like the limits of our cognition and become much more humble about their thinking. And the like the people who I think really go awry get this feeling of like, well, I know everything oh, I about cognitive bias now. And so my thinking is so much more elevated. And like I often will watch these people and like nobody becomes more self-deluded than that. I'll note there's a, a related thing in, in politics where, and this is like endlessly proven out now, people with the highest levels of political information tend to exhibit the highest levels of partisan self-deception. There is just like, it is like, this is a very hard line to walk, but there is nothing more dangerous than like thinking, you know, a lot and nothing more dangerous part than thinking, you know, a lot about how you think like you really need a lot of humility. And so at the best, I think the rationality community imposes humility on itself. And at the worst, there's a performance of imposing humility. There's a way of not actually having humility, right? That is yeah. a way of, you know, I've known forever, you know, at Wonk Blog and other things, things seem more convincing if you put them in chart form. Like, they just look more official. Yeah. I appreciate, you know, Scott and others will sometimes put, like, epistemic, you know, status, like 60% on the top of, like, 5,000 <laughs> words of super aggressive argumentation. But, like, I, I like is, he, is the effect of that epistemic status to make people, like, oh, I should, like, be careful with this? Yeah. Or is it, like, this person's super it's rational simple. and self-critical, and actually now I super I, I believe him totally? Um I, and I'm not picking on Scott here. A lot of people do this. Larry Summers like did this all the time. He was he was known in the administration for he would constantly when people were saying something be like, well, what probability do you put on that? And so people are just pulling like 20 percent, 30 percent, 70 percent probabilities out of thin air. That makes things sound more convincing. But at the um, I, I, I always think at the danger of making people of actually it having the reverse effect, it should sometimes the language of probability um, reads to folks uh, like, well, you can really trust this person. And so instead of being skeptical, you're less skeptical. So those are just pitfalls that that, that I notice and, and it's worth watching out for as I have to do in myself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a tricky thing with any large group of people is that uh, they tend to be potentially very different from one another. So there's like definitely some people for whom these these critiques are relevant and there's people who are almost like the, the exact opposite. It's just what happens when you have thousands, Absolutely. thousands of people. Absolutely. Um, it is very interesting that I feel like Effect, the effective altruism community focuses on like extremely measurable things and then completely unmeasurable things. And like, it's kind of surprising yeah. that there aren't more things that are in the middle because you think that most things would be kind of kind of measurable. Uh, and I wonder whether there's some this, this is a little bit what why. I was saying that yeah. that I think it's interesting. There's like less focus on 20 years from now in AI and jobs than I would think mm -hmm. there is in this community. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it has actually changed. There's been like a kind of this merger in the last couple of years between the people who are concerned about long term stuff in AI and the immediate term stuff in AI because they've like it seems like they've come up with research agendas that have just turned out to be like two sides of the same thing. It's really quite interesting. Um, yeah, I've, I've done an interview with uh, Brian Christian who wrote the the alignment problem, which kind of describes this phenomenon of how it, it, like <laughs> it's almost funny. It's almost hard for me to remember five years ago how these two camps like seem to be really at odds with one another, and now they just all seem to be singing from the same song sheet. So, so that seems like progress to me, anyway. I, I need to read that book. It's been like I, I it's been recommended to me by everybody I trust. And I yeah. just like I, I need to read the alignment problem. Um yeah. So you mentioned the precipice by by Toby Ord. How much have you engaged with kind of the arguments for and against long termism? And do you have any kind of uh yeah, critiques of it or, or reservations? I don't think I have a critique of it, to be honest. I think that I have engaged with the critique with the arguments of long termism, you know, to the extent of the person who's interested in those arguments. Yeah. And I think that, you know, whatever like small, like around the edges disagreements I have with any particular argument, which people in this community are, are very willing to hear, like I, I love talking to, to Toby, I think the general push um, from the long termists is incredibly, incredibly important. We're obviously like not taking this stuff seriously enough by any means. Uh, so 
I don't really have a critique value. I mean, I get a little, I am, I think you can get into a kind of like mathematical blackmail mm. situation where when you start running the numbers on like the endless future potential of humanity, then like, you know, any in unbelievably infinitesimal change in, in modernity, you know, like it has like such an outsized impact that like, well, it's of course worth doing overdoing anything else. Um, I don't buy that for a bunch of different reasons, including like, I don't think we understand all that well necessarily, like how to have those effects and something Dylan uh, has written that I've always thought is quite smart mm. is that, you know, let's say you're, you're dealing with a question between putting, you know, $5 billion into something that is like long-termist and putting $5 billion into say a child allowance. Mm. You may, um, you know, for some set of kids, like it actually may be more helpful to be helping people be more educated and healthier now so they can then like using the better resources of 30 years from now. Right. So like to this to the extent um, yeah. this stuff ends up biting, I don't even think it's always clear which direction it bites in knowing the long term is important. Uh, you know, maybe the best way to, to secure the long term is to secure the the right now. But I don't want to use that as a strong critique. I think this is functionally a really correct way to think. Um, and on a lot of these issues, we don't do nearly enough. So to, to give a couple of examples, we just need to be doing so much more on the question of synthetic biological weapons. Mm. Uh, that is just one of these ones where I don't even think you need to get into, like, will we ever invent general intelligence AI? Like, it is entirely plausible, like, really, really in the near term. Like, I, plausibly now even that people could with pretty routine ingredients terrorists could create things that would kill billions of people you know um and it's terrifying yeah. uh, i think one of the best parts of toby's book is just like the looking at uh like like some of the pandemic threats that have come up and you know for instance i think it was it's either h1n1 or h5n1 i think it was that it's a it's a swine flu as I remember this with a seventy percent lethality rate if it gets to if it gets to humans but it doesn't pass human to human, uh, but then some researcher trying to study it passed it through ten ferrets, and made a version of it that could pass human to human which caused an uproar in the the research community but it's just yeah. terrifying to think about so you know there are a set of threats that are obvious um, that would really really affect the long term and we should take it profoundly more seriously than we do yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done an interview with uh, Andy Weber, who's uh, used to work in Department of Defense, uh, where he lays out basically what he thinks is like potentially a permanent solution to this issue of synthetic biology being being so risky. And he thinks it's like it's very risky today and will be worse in 10 years, which is uh, kind of using nanopore sequences to just constantly monitor like new viruses and new bacteria that are, that are circulating. And then using mRNA, having massive ability to quickly manufacture mRNA vaccines, because now we can just cram, crack out new vaccines really quickly just based on the DNA strand. Uh, yeah. and he basically thinks that that could take these kind of bioweapons off the table, which is like a really exciting, uh, you know, <laughs> avenue of research within science and technology. And we should do it. Like, and yeah. and all, obviously, like, it's not like it wouldn't be useful to have a lot of mRNA vaccination capacity. So, <laughs> like, let's do it. Just you know. So, it. yeah, I really want to be. I really want to be like. I want my position understood here is not I have some on the margins disagreements about certain ideas of long termism. Yeah. Long termism is an incredibly, incredibly healthy, um, you know, intellectual force, and it's like among the things that I would like to, you know, be be an ally of in the public conversation not not somebody trying to poke holes in it yeah just on, on the bias thing that you uh, that you mentioned earlier i think i would go further in your in your actual critique of the or kind of the biased literature and people reading about cognitive biases i think that it's almost like not useful at all <laughs> because well to begin with like obviously it's this kind of psychology research that often just doesn't replicate so i suspect that many of these effects like in fact uh, will turn out in you know in 10 20 years time we we'll don't won't think that they're real but even among those that do exist the, the model that people have in their heads with biases is like I am like mostly thinking right, but then occasionally I'll have like a bias uh, in a specific situation, and then I will like learn to catalog all of those, and then like when I when I'm having one of those, I'll I'll correct from this like thing because now I'm going to be like plus 10 percent, and then I'll download it, grade it ten percent, and I have the right answer. But the reality is, you're just like swimming in like these like potential errors, or like you're, you're just using all of these processes that are very imprecise all the time, and like you get rid of like one bias, and there's just going to be another like. You'd, it's not that you have one bias at a particular point in time that you can uh, access. It's like there's 20 things going on at any point in time and getting rid of any one of them doesn't like really help all, the, all that much. And I think you do just end up with this like illusion that you're thinking better than other people. I, I think that it's very important to try to be more rational and try to like <laughs> have, have better ways of reaching the right answer. But I think like trying to do this correction for biases is like mostly a poor use of people's effort. Yeah, and, and mostly what it ends up with the people is correcting for other people's biases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
right? Like in, in practice, everybody's like, I really understand that I can be thinking this way. But what I'm really seeing with you right now is a lot of motivated reasoning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, right? Like, I mean, it's usually true. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've always said on some of this research, uh, I have a chapter of my book. It's about some of the stuff in the political context. And, and I say that, you know, this research is like staring into the abyss. Yeah. Um, the more you get into it, the more you realize like there is no escape. And even the ways you would escape yeah. uh, tend to make you more vulnerable to, to, to certain kinds of looking at this. And yet also somehow we have to operate in a world where, where some things are, are true, you know, or we, where we at least are willing to say some things are true. Yeah. You know, there is no doubt that I have a lot of political biases that inform my writing. And also to some point I need to be willing to say, I think the way that Republican politicians <laughs> in Texas responded to the, the, the freeze was really bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, am I biased? In saying that, yes. Am I pretty confident of the so empirical true. evidence on which I'm saying that? Yes. It's yeah. just hard. Like, I think the place this should leave you is a, like my, my lesson on this stuff for myself is like the place this literature should leave you in is a place of profound discomfort with yourself. Mm. Yeah. And like, if you're not, if you, if you, if it's making you feel like real good, then you're probably not absorbing it correctly. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a more optimistic story to be told here if you look at the kind of heuristic literature, because there's all of these studies to try to find like, oh, here's like how people mess up and get things wrong. But it's also extraordinary how often like people can get incredibly complicated things right, like very, very quickly and how they man they're managing to do these sh shortcuts that avoid like doing very complicated analysis, but still like get a pretty good enough answer very fast. Yeah. I think there's, yeah, there's a whole way that we could have gone down. Like, how do people think right? Like, how do they do a really good job? And then kind of trying to celebrate that and expand that. Instead, it's like these, maybe it's just easier to study, like ways that people get things slightly wrong in these like bizarre experimental setups that probably don't generalize to the world. Um, I, I don't know. Oh, maybe it's just like more fulfilling to criticize. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly why we went down that track rather than that appreciating the ways that people are good at reasoning. Negativity bias is an important yeah, bias. <laughs> Very <laughs> great point. Um, Particularly in other people. Are there any... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Are there any effective altruism-ish projects that you've kind of considered doing but uh, but decided against? Or any maybe, yeah, effective altruist themes like uh, theme projects that you might want to suggest to, to listeners that they could potentially take on? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, no, Future Perfect was was the big one that I'm, you know, proud to have been a part of and proud that it's, you know, that they've done such an extraordinary, you know, job and I read it every day and love it and, you know, hope it continues to thrive. Uh, and then obviously, like, my own work, you know, to me is sort of a... a, a project of trying to make the the world a better place hmm. I, I don't think i have great ideas of what other people should be doing yeah. doing beyond that sorry fair enough um yeah so over the last 10 to well for decades people have been worried about uh, the next pandemic how about how bad it will be um often those people were kind of re reviewed as uh cassandras or they were viewed as people who are just like always always worried about stuff mm -hmm. like always worried about tail risks they're kind of quirky uh, like can we really trust their judgment uh, but kind of they've been proven right uh, last year. And many of those people have also at the same time been worried about other kinds of terror risks like, you know, what if we have a nuclear war with Russia by accident? Or what if we go to war with China over Taiwan, even though we didn't really plan to? Or what if like, what if AI really does go off the rails and, and cause massive problems? Has kind of the last 18 months made you like reconsider like whether maybe we should just be more worried about those like about wacky terror risk scenarios? Maybe the world's like more variable and dangerous than we think? Yes and no. No in the sense, let, let me frame differently what I think the, the epistemological failures were here. So everything you're saying is true. Um, but I would say even a lot of the people who miss this believed all that abstractly. Hmm. And so I've been thinking a lot about media failures around coronavirus. And so, you know, like Adbox, for instance, we had run, I personally did a long video with Bill Gates about the next pandemic, <laughs> the next like respiratory pandemic, which got millions of views years ago. Then we did a Netflix episode on pandemics, like, and we did this Ron Klain thing on pandemics. I think actually very few places had done like as much like, like shaking, you know, the, the trees being like, listen, like a pandemic is a serious threat. And at the yeah. same time, uh, while we had like some early coverage of this, it was good. And some that was, you know, not as perceptive. We were not like able to see immediately like this was going to be the one. And I've been thinking yeah. a lot about how do you not make that mistake? Mm -hmm. And one of the difficult things here was even coming from a view that pandemics are a gigantic threat. And one of them is likely to kill millions and millions of people like in, you know, within the next 10 or 20 years. When this one started up, like the way journalism is optimized to work, uh, you call a bunch of experts and say what they tell you. 
And the public health community was like playing this down for a long time. You know, we were hearing like, oh, worry more about the flu and, you know, wash your hands and, you know, oh, this could be a problem, but there's not going to be human to human transition transmission. And it's all well and good to say, obviously, people got that one wrong. But like, what is like, what is the heuristic you would use to overrule the experts in a case like this in the future? Like, what would I tell a young journalist, you know, such that in the many, many, many things we look at where like every year as a journalist, you deal with a lot of things that could become an unbelievable crisis. Like the number of like things that might become the next financial crisis that I get pitched on in three months <laughs> is big. And like, I never quite know, right? They're all convincing arguments. Like one, I one spent some time right. looking into the, and one of them, and some of them have been right, right? But a lot of them, way more of them have been wrong. Um, and yeah. so, by the way, have a number of possible pandemic threats. And, you know, there's like a big theory of a food supply crisis about eight months ago now that didn't pan out in that way, at least. Mm. And so it, it's really hard. Um, so one is obviously, like, I think you want to listen to people who've had really good and have demonstrated and shown, like, really good habits of thinking here. So I've done, um, I just did a, a podcast with Zainab Tufetsky. Um, Tufetsky. I always say her name incorrect. Is that Tufecchi? I, yeah, Tufecchi. Sorry, let me say it again. Tufecchi? Tufecchi, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I just did a podcast... I just did a podcast with Zainab Tufecchi about how she thinks, right? And she is a, somebody with a track record, I think, of getting a lot of big things right mm-hmm. over an extended period of time. Some of the people you talk about, I, I should know, and this is one issue, do not get a lot of things right. They got like one big thing right or a couple of big things right. And they also get a lot of big things wrong constantly. Yeah. And so as a journalist, it's hard to know what to do with that. We're like journalism, the way I would put it, it's optimized to get like 19 out of 20 things right. Mm-hmm. But the time it's going to fail is going to be really bad because it's going to be when all the experts are failing too. Mm. And then there are people who they're optimized to get like, you know, three or four or five out of 20 things, like really, like really unusual things right. And it's okay if they get a bunch of things wrong. That's not a knock on them. It's actually a kind of thinking we need. It's a very different incentive structure, Mm. but it's not always clear like what to do with somebody who is right about this, but also like wrong about a bunch of other things. So I think it's just... Like, I don't mean to say, like, I hope this doesn't come off as defensive. It's something I'm wrestling with a lot, like, because I think about it in terms of what advice would I give journalists to use for the future? So I think there's some people you should come out of this having a higher trust in, like Zainab. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in general, like, just like one generalized thing to feel is if everybody is saying and you also believe something is going to go wrong, like, believe it. Don't just keep saying it. Like, really believe it in your bones. Mm-hmm. Um, so something I've been thinking about a lot recently is, like, everybody tells me antibiotic resistance is a terrible problem that is looming um, down, you know, in human civilization. Yeah. And I would tell you, if you ask me, antibiotic resistance is a terrible problem looming for human civilization. But do I believe it? Right? Am I actually acting like I believe anything. it? Like, am I, su- yeah. am I super on the alert for any information that that problem is coming up? Yeah. You know, similar to the, the the synthetic biological weapon conversation we just had has the same qualities to it. So, yeah, like I think there's, and then on the other hand, if like we all, one of the tricky things is if I if I just if I just move up my just constant level of alarm about all looming threats. And keep writing columns about how you need to be super scared about things. Are people going to tune me out? Yeah, it's a it's a genuinely tricky space. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, one thing I wonder is why weren't more uh, like it seems like the the journalist doing pandemics at the New York Times should ideally be like a world expert in pandemics who can form their own view <coughs> about like whether the experts are getting this right and can do research and figure things out rather than just a dilettante who like has to go to a press conference with some public health people and then kind of writes down what they say but it doesn't feel in a position to, to question them I feel like no a lot of the that's that's very unfair yeah. a lot of these people at high levels really are excellent at these issues and really did do a lot of research I mean you know, Julia Blues at Vox had covered pandemics for years. She had a great piece very early in this. It was like it was called something like um, eight ways a coronavirus could play out. And there were four about how it could become like a global pandemic and four about how not. It was great probabilistic coverage. I really want to push on this. The fact like journalists who are very expert in some topics, and I count myself in certain topics as one of them. Yeah you still like talk to a lot of experts to try to inform yourself because it's a lot to trust yourself on. Um, that's also not how, that's not the, it's one thing to be a columnist to be like, I got some views on stuff, but yeah. if you're, you know, writing in the news section of the New York times, you can know a lot, but you have to like, as a good Bayesian to maybe put this yeah. in, in, in more of your language, <laughs> like, yeah. like you have to put some weight on what, you know, all these other people who, you know, do this research themselves totally. tell you. Like, yeah, that's I, a that's a tough space. Yeah, I didn't want to suggest that all journalists were in that situation. Like, I think Julia is 
an example of someone who like knows has more subject um, subject expertise and for that reason was able to do better coverage. It, it's, it, my, my impression, vaguely, like generally, is is that the people who knew more about the field going in like produced better coverage and like got the right answers sooner uh, than people who were just going in going in afresh. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think yes and no. I, I mean, you know, people like I'll give a non journalistic example, but people have I think correctly noted like some of the people you're talking about as being prescient were on this faster and better than Fauci was. Yeah. They didn't have more, and, and well, nor did a lot of people. But but I do think there's like an interesting question here of um, there were people who had a lot of knowledge who got this fast and people who had a lot of knowledge who got this slow. And in some ways, like the question was not even the knowledge. In some ways, the question was like, how do you understand the information coming out of China, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you weight what they're telling you? And, you know, what do you think is true about, you know, preparedness? And I just think it's complicated. I don't yeah. want to uh, absolve anybody. I just want to say, like, uh, like my only point is that, like, I think there are real failures we need to learn from here in journalism, like, you know, have, like, like is true whenever we get something really big wrong. This is just one of the places where I've, like, had a lot of trouble thinking of, what would be the rule I'd give for a young reporter? Somebody who's like very senior in the field and super experienced, like that's one thing, like that's a different set of issues. Um, but but like, how do we teach the next generation of journalists not to miss something again? Yeah. But when that thing is being, it's just hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a tricky question as an editor. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're up on time. I can, for people who are interested in this, I can really recommend you know, the interview that you did with Zainab. I thought it was fantastic. And I'm, I'm hoping to get her, her on the show uh, as, as, as soon as possible, uh, basically. Um, yeah, just one final question is you're like, insanely productive constantly producing content articles podcasts tweets um how are you managing to do that while also having kind of a, a, a young child is 18 months old like it seems like it would be a very difficult thing to, to balance uh, all of the things that you're trying to accomplish uh, <laughs> well my my subjective experience of myself is that i'm always getting a lot less done and feeling more harried and behind than i'd like to so yeah. so i appreciate it I don't know. I, I don't. Sometimes I get this question and I'm glad I look very productive to others. And sometimes <laughs> I feel um, not as productive to myself. I, I, I think the thing that I am pretty good at is I have a I have a really, really rapid cycle from I want to do something to I'm executing on it. Like I don't spend a lot of time like in like meta analysis. I don't get in my own way that much. I'm a pretty fast writer. Uh, and then the other thing is. I'm pretty focused. You were talking about reading the news. Mm. I actually read a lot less news than people might think, yeah. at least general news. Like I have the things I am working on and I read really intensively in them. And then I let a lot of other things go by. I like, I let a lot of other balls go by. And that means there are things that are, everybody else is talking about that I don't know about, mm. but it's helpful. Um, and it's, you know, I really try to say to myself, like every week work wise, I need to do one excellent column and two excellent podcasts. And like, everything needs to be oriented towards that happening yeah. and then tweets and everything else like that's extra most of it is distraction um but if i'm focused i can do that and if i'm not focused i can't um and so that's where like that's where the rubber hits the road but yeah you know i will say there's no doubt that having a young child really really makes you know is wonderful in a bazillion ways and i certainly wouldn't trade it to be a little bit more productive but it does change the way you work um you know and, and really does force decisions you didn't have to make before when you could you know just cording your time out in all directions yeah my guest today has been uh, ezra klein uh, thanks so much for coming on the on the 80 000 hours podcast ezra thank you it's been a pleasure